Welcome to this series on neural network programming with PyTorch. In this one, we'll show how to implement a forward method for a convolutional neural network in PyTorch. Without further ado, let's get started. So far in this series, we've prepared our data and we're now in the process of building our model. We created a network by extending the neural network module PyTorch base class. And then in our class constructor, we define the network's layers as class attributes. Now we need to implement our network's for method and then we'll finally be ready to train our model. At the moment, we know that our for method accepts a tensor as input and then returns a tensor as output. Right now, the tensor that is returned is the same tensor that is passed. However, after we build out our implementation, the return tensor will be the output of our network. This means that our for method implementation will use all of the layers we defined inside the constructor. In this way, the for method explicitly defines the network's transformation. For this reason, the for method is the mapping that maps an input tensor to a prediction output tensor. Let's see how this is done. First, recall that in our network's constructor, we have five layers defined. We have two convolutional layers and three linear layers. If we count the input layer, this gives us a network with a total of six layers. Let's code this up. We'll kick things off with the input layer. The input layer of any neural network is determined by the input data. For example, if our input tensor contains three elements, our network will have three nodes contained in its input layer. For this reason, we can think of the input layer as the identity transformation. Mathematically, this is the function defined for any x as f of x equals x. We give any x as the input and we get back the same x as the output. The data in is the data out. This is a pretty trivial function and this is precisely the reason we usually don't see the input layer when we are working with neural network APIs. The input layer exists implicitly. It's definitely not required but for the sake of completion we'll go ahead and show the identity operation in our for method. There. So with our input layer, we have T coming in and T coming out. There's no change here for our tensor T. To perform the convolution operation, we pass the tensor to the for method of the first convolutional layer, self.conf1. We've learned in the past how all PyTorch neural network modules have a for method. And when we call the for method of an nn.module class instance, there's a special way we make the call. We call the actual instance instead of calling the for method directly. Make sure you see the previous post in the series to see all of the details on this. Let's go ahead now and add the calls needed to implement both of our convolutional layers. As we can see here, our input tensor is transformed as we move through the convolutional layers. The first conf layer has a convolutional operation followed by a ReLU activation operation whose output is then passed to a max pooling operation with a kernel size of two and a stride of two. The output tensor T of the first convolutional layer is then passed to the next conf layer, which is identical to the first except that we call self.conf2 instead of self.conf1. Each of these layers is comprised of a collection of weights and a collection of operations. The weights are encapsulated inside the neural network module layer class instances. Both the ReLU operation and the max pooling operation are just 
pure operations. Neither of these have weights, and this is why we are calling them directly from the NN.functional API. Sometimes we may hear pooling operations referred to as pooling layers. Sometimes we may even hear activation operations called activation layers. However, what makes a layer distinct from an operation is that layers have weights. Since pulling operations and activation functions do not have weights, we will refer to them as simply operations and view them as being added to the collection of layer operations. For example, we'll say that the second layer in our network is a convolutional layer that contains a collection of weights and performs three operations, a convolution operation, a ReLU activation operation, and a max pooling operation. The main thing that we need to be aware of is which operations are defined using weights and which ones do not use weights. Historically, the operations defined using weights are called layers, and later, other operations were added to the mix, like activation functions and pooling operations. And this addition caused some confusion in terminology. Mathematically, the entire network is just a composition of functions. And a composition of functions is a function itself. All the terms like layers, activation functions, and weights are just used to help describe the different parts of the network. Don't let these terms confuse the fact that the whole network is simply a composition of functions. And what we are doing now is defining this composition inside our forward method. Before we pass our input to the first hidden linear layer, we must reshape or flatten our tensor. This will be the case anytime we are passing output from a conf layer as input to a linear layer. Since the fourth layer is the first linear layer, we will include our shaping operation as part of the fourth layer. We saw in the post on CNN weights that the number 12 in the reshaping operation is determined by the number of output channels coming from the previous conf layer. However, the 4 times 4 was left as an open question. Let's reveal the answer now. The 4 times 4 is actually the height and width of each of the 12 output channels. We started with a 1 by 28 by 28 input tensor, and by the time our tensor arrives at the first linear layer, the height and width dimensions have been reduced from 28 by 28 to 4 by 4. This reduction is due to the convolution and pooling operations. We'll see how this works and see a formula for calculating these reductions in the next post. For now, let's finish implementing this forward method. After the tensor is reshaped, we pass the flattened tensor to the linear layer and pass the result of this to the ReLU activation function. The sixth and final layer of our network is a linear layer that we call the output layer. When we pass our tensor to the output layer, the result will be the prediction tensor. Since our data has 10 prediction classes, we know our output tensor will have 10 elements. The values inside each of the 10 components correspond to the prediction value for each of our prediction classes. With hidden layers, we usually use ReLU as our nonlinear activation function. But for the output layer, whenever we have a single category that we're trying to predict, we use the softmax activation function. The softmax function returns a positive probability for each of the prediction classes, and these probabilities sum to one. However, in our case, we won't use softmax here because of the loss function that we'll be using during the training process. We'll be using the cross entropy loss function from the nn.functional class, which implicitly performs a softmax operation on its input. So here, we'll just return the result of the last linear transformation. The implication of this is that our network will be trained using the softmax operation, but will not need to compute the additional operation when the network is being used for inference after the training process is complete. 
This is how we implement the for method for a convolutional neural network in PyTorch. Don't forget the blog post for this video on deeplizard.com. And if you haven't already, be sure to check out the Deep Lizard Hive Mind where you can get exclusive perks and rewards. Thanks for contributing to Collective Intelligence. I'll see you in the next one.